Brother Rod Martin is going to be closing out our time together. Our final speaker, he is the founder and CEO of Martin Capital. I don't think I can do any better on the introduction than to quote uh, something I saw on his uh, on his Twitter profile uh, describing him from The Guardian, a philosopher capitalist. I mean, that's pretty good. So, Brother Rod, come on up. So I'm your final speaker of the day. God help us all. John had a lot of good stuff to say there. I would add just as an addendum and a segue into what I have to say that we kind of square this family circle through adoption, which is itself a picture of the gospel. You know, this is the greatest immigrant nation in the history of the world. There's nothing to compare to it, really. And if you go to France, you discover very quickly, you can move to France, but you can't become French. You can move to Japan, but you can't become Japanese. You can move to China, but you can't become Chinese. You can move to Germany, but you aren't a German. I was actually born in Germany. I was born in Wiesbaden. My dad was in the Air Force. And... Uh, so some of y'all have seen that hospital on TV when the hostages came back from Iran. They were at that hospital in Wiesbaden where I was born. It's closed now. Uh, it was built in the 30s. I have the right to be a dual citizen, which John correctly calls for the abolition of. Um, I've never availed myself of it because I just don't think I can be loyal to two countries at once. I don't think that works and I don't think it should work here. Um, but I could legally do that. You know what I couldn't be? I could never be a German. But people from all over the world become Americans. And they become Americans because we are actually, as John correctly said, a family. A nation is a pretty good analogy uh, to the family in a number of ways. It is absolutely the extension of families. It's, it, a nation is a great big tribe. We adopt people into the American nation, which is a picture of the gospel. But when you're adopted into the body of Christ, you actually have to conform to the body of Christ. The body of Christ does not conform to you. When people are adopted into the American nation, we've always believed in assimilation. We've always believed in the melting pot. And so when, when John talks about Anglo-Protestant culture, he is absolutely correct. Uh, some of my ancestors came over in 1608. Some of my uh, settled uh, Jamestown and actually uh, that particular 11th great grandfather was an original investor in the Virginia company years before they actually came over and settled. Another of my ancestors, General Joseph Martin, was a Revolutionary War general, and his dad had come over from Bristol uh, not many years before. He laid out uh, Charlottesville, Virginia with Peter Jefferson, Thomas's dad. And, uh, you know, the, uh, we've been here a while. And from England, no less. So I am an English-American. And, uh, and I'm happy that we have every nation and race here. But if you're going to come here, you need to be an American. Yeah. And to be an American involves a heritage that is unique to not just this country, but to uh, the, the state of which we are a successor, the common law matters because honestly the common law approach is a picture of how we're supposed to interpret scripture it comes from our theologians the civil law approach comes to us from the pagan romans and it's a disaster and a train wreck and it it, it leads to totalitarianism it's it's somewhat totalitarian in its essence whereas the common law assumes liberty you know we have we have an entire system that developed over time Christianly. And I think it has reached its apotheosis so far in the United States of America. 
And I think that's worth fighting for. I think that's worth defending. I think that we better defend it. Um, we are looking at losing it and, and possibly irreparably. Um, this is not, uh, uh, John's not wrong, obviously, when he says that we're functioning like an empire. We're being ruled by a, an aristocratic class uh, in the capital. But the, but the truth of the matter is, we're also not really quite there. We're kind of in Rome in the 30s BC. We're kind of in the third Star Wars prequel. <laughs> Jar Jar Banks is about to sell us out, folks. It, it's bad, you know. And, and we need to understand that. You're not just fighting for yourself. You're not even just fighting for your kids or your grandkids. What you're fighting for is the whole world. Because the American Republic has been an amazing force for good across planet Earth, sometimes more than others, but an incredible force for good. And I'll give you a perfect example of that. American Christians, we're always talking about the evils of American Christianity. Well, excuse me, American Christians, America is 4% of the world's population, but American Christians give six times the total to international missions what all other Christians on earth combined give. Just snuffing that out is a dark age. Just that. Tim Walls tells us there is no First Amendment protection for misinformation, which, as you perfectly well know, is defined as whatever he disagrees with. <laughs> Not necessarily what he thinks is false. Right. He knew perfectly well Hunter Biden's laptop was real. Hunter testified to that in court in case you missed it. And yet 51 senior former intelligence officers testified in a letter to you that that was a lie and we have polling that shows that the difference in that lie and the public knowing the truth was the election. Yeah. You want to talk about election interference? Your intelligence community stole the election. That's before you get to Dominion. That's before you get to 2,000 mules. That's before you get to mail-in ballots. That's before you get to anything in this world. The whole thing has been corrupted in, in countless ways, and we're hanging on by a thread. But guys, you actually must participate because we have to win to have a chance to win. If you just lose, they don't have to cheat. And if you win, you've got a fighting chance. It's tragic that I'm having to say that from a pulpit in the United States of America. I never dreamed that I would live to see a day when I would have to say such a thing. On the other hand, I'm a Gen Xer, so I grew up on Red Dawn, so that's okay. <laughs> Folks, it's hanging by a thread, and it'll cost the world its blessings. It will cast us into a dark age. I don't know how long. Hitler only lasted 12 years. The Soviets lasted 70. The Chinese Communist Party's still going. Rhodesia was the breadbasket of Africa, had many, many flaws, not justifying them, that's not my point. But Zimbabwe, the successor state, the Marxist kleptocracy that replaced it, is a wasteland, a disaster for all except, of course, that ruling elite. So what happens in Rome in the 40s and 30s and 20s BC? They transform from a republic to an empire. And that empire, you know, we think of it as lasting for about 500 years after that. No. It lasted for almost 1,500 years after that. 
The East Roman Empire didn't fall in 476. The East Roman Empire was a going concern almost to the time of Christopher Columbus, whose day we just celebrated. And we did celebrate it, just to be clear. No Indigenous Peoples Day, thank you, you know. The human sacrifices will now cease, you know. The empire lasted and lasted and lasted. So there's no guarantee that you're done with this in 12 years. And you wouldn't want to live through that 12 years anyway, would you? Right. The Republic stood for centuries. The empire stood for a millennium and a half. And we must not allow that to be the human future because the United States is uniquely blessed in a thousand ways that aren't going to go away. Just our internal waterways alone provide an engine of capital formation so great that America will always be the richest country on the planet, barring nuclear Armageddon. I mean, there's just no way to, to possibly compete with America when you get right down to it. And the kind of people who will subjugate you will gladly subjugate the planet. They're not going to stop here. They're going to do what the left always does. They're going to lie to you about what they're really after until they go get what they really want. They lied to you about their commitment to free speech, didn't they? You grew up on... Well, I, I may disagree with what you say, but I defend to the death your right to say it. Right. Liars. Uh -huh. They want to shut down every thought. Every thought must be held captive to the state. Yeah. We heard the story earlier of, of 2 plus 2 equals 5 in Orwell's classic 1984. The part that didn't get told of that story is the part where Winston's torturer tells him after the long buildup, this is kind of the punchline, two plus two equals whatever the party tells you. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we have articles now in learned journals and major publications that say math is racist. Logic is racist. Two plus two doesn't necessarily equal four. Achievement is racist. Entrepreneurship is racist. Everything is racist. Why? Because class warfare didn't sell in the United States, so they switched. They adopted critical theory in all its various forms, queer theory, critical race theory, radical feminism, take your pick, doesn't matter. It's all aimed at divide and conquer. It's all aimed at splitting up that American family. We've adopted people from the whole world. An adopted child is a member of the family just like a natural child. But they do live by the family's rules. They do live by the family's values. They do move the family forward into the next generation. That's the deal. Why do you think we're having our borders flooded with millions of people who not only won't assimilate but cannot assimilate because they are a permanent criminal underclass because of their legal status? You think that's accidental? It's very deliberate. It's deliberate so that you have people who are permanently alienated from the people they are displacing and that there must always be struggle and strife and hate, race hate, culture hate, nationality hate, ethnic hate, ideological hate. Doesn't matter. Who cares? They're just like Palpatine. Feel your anger. <laughs> Because they know if you've got that going, they've got you. You're focused on each other instead of on them. This is the story of the South. The South was plunged into an extra century of night after the Civil War. You know, we got, we got laid waste to down there. It was like we got nuked or something in large parts of the country. And if you go to Mississippi, you can see that that war ended about a week ago. So, you know, nothing's really changed. But, but for a century after that, we did Jim Crow. 
Well, why'd we do that? And by the way, why did we start that about 20, 30 years after the war? We hadn't been segregated under slavery. Why'd we start this apartheid thing a generation after the war? Oh, I can tell you, it's very simple. The populist party was winning state legislatures across the Midwest. And the Southern Democrats looked around and said, uh-uh, not here. And so they divided the poor whites from the poor blacks and cast themselves as the defenders of white virginity. All they've done is change out which race. The Democratic Party tore this country asunder in the 1860s, tore this country asunder for a century after that, and now they're doing it again. It's the same playbook over and over and over again. Pit people against each other and rule them again and again and again. And it is time that we wake up to it. You can get really agitated arguing about whether South Carolina had a right to secede. Well, yeah. No doubt they did. There's not a single state would have entered the Union if it hadn't believed it could leave. That's true. You know what they didn't have a right to do? They didn't have a right to fire on Fort Sumter. They started the war, and Lincoln finished it. And if that offends anybody, well, tough. You know, we can argue about that over dinner. That'll be fun. Does it matter? Here's how I see the Civil War. Have you heard my accent? <laughs> Here's how I see the Civil War. It was a war between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party in the South wanted to create a slave-based aristocracy. The Republican Party in the North believed in free soil, free labor, free men. And we can argue about the niceties of it from a constitutional perspective, and I have serious mixed emotions about that, and John and I would mostly agree. But it doesn't change the fact that somebody started the war and somebody else finished it, and you wouldn't have had a war in the first place if the Democratic Party hadn't wanted to use race to divide people so they could rule them. And by the way, the Democratic candidate for president of the United States in 1864, after the fall of Atlanta, after Sherman had marched to the sea, was campaigning on letting the South go. Because the Democrats always want to split up America. The Democrats always want to tear down America. The Democrats always want to create this aristocracy in which a small elite pretends to be populists and in reality rules us all. And we lived under that in the South for a century. The Democrat planter class continued to rule the South with an iron fist for a century after the war. I was, I, I grew up in Arkansas, and uh, V.O. Key, who is the great scholar of Southern politics, wrote a book by that name in 1949. V.O. Key said that while most of the South was, was composed of one-party states, Arkansas actually had to be categorized as a no-party state because everyone was a Democrat to such a degree that partisanship did not matter and the only thing that mattered was the interpersonal relationships of the competing factions. When I was a teenager, one county out of 75 had a Republican government. One. When I was policy director for Governor Mike Huckabee, we had 11 members out of 100 in the State House of Representatives. We had four members out of 35 in the State Senate. He was governor for 10 and a half years and never had one third of either house of his state legislature. Not even one third. His veto, by the way, for reference, could be overridden with 51%. So it mattered. The Democrats ruled us for generations because the divide and conquer strategy works. And lots of people wanted to do something about that. 
You'll hear Democrats talk about the evils of lynching, and they're right to do so. I just wish they'd take some responsibility. All the lynchings were carried out by the terror wing of the Democratic Party, which at the time was the Ku Klux Klan. Today, they have two terror wings, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. In all three cases, they murder people, they burn down buildings, Back in the, even the 1960s, it was not uncommon for a man's barn to be burned because his wife volunteered for Winthrop Rockefeller's gubernatorial campaign. That was perfectly common. 4,000 people in America were lynched. Want to guess the political affiliation of them? 3,000 of the 4,000 were black, 1,000 were white. Over 97% of those people were Republicans, black and white. Yeah, we had a war between parties and we're having another one. Hopefully it will not be a shooting war. But it kind of already is when they're burning down Portland and they're burning down Minneapolis and you just know what's coming if Trump wins. It's going to be mayhem for at least a few months and possibly a few years because that's who they are. Look, when Kamala has a rally and a heckler shows up and says, Jesus is king, and she says, I think you've gone to the, you're at the wrong rally. Yeah. 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 That's who they are. In 2012, the Democratic National Convention on live international television booed the mere mention of the word God. And some of you didn't notice. And some of you thought, oh, well, you know, that's kind of an anomaly. No, that's who they are. They hate you. And the answer is not to hate them back. The answer is to love your neighbor as yourself. The answer is to take him the gospel. The answer is to pray for him. But the answer is certainly not to let them run this country. So this conference is called Jesus and Politics, and I'm finally to my topic. <laughs> and my topic is this. Politics is an unmitigated blessing. Some of you are going to be like, what the heck are you talking about, Rod? Nope. Say it again. Politics is an unmitigated blessing. So let's talk about that. What is politics? Oh, that's easy. Politics is how we govern ourselves. In an aristocratic system, the aristocrats govern you and you don't have a say. In a monarchy... Sometimes the monarch rules, mon meaning one, um, he rules and you don't. Uh, in a communist system, oh wait, that's just an aristocracy or a monarchy. <laughs> you caught that, right? In North Korea, they've stopped even pretending. We're on the third hereditary successor. <laughs> hey, they're, they're not even claiming different now. They might as well just make, make him king, because that's what he is, although he has more power than any king of Korea ever had. Mm -hmm. The CCP is a monarchy. Now, it was an oligarchy. It was an aristocracy, but now it's a monarchy because Xi Jinping has purged everybody who could possibly threaten him. This is a little scary because it's a little hard to know what he's thinking. He's so isolated now, there's no really good way to spy on him. He's completely isolated. He gets no good counsel. And they're really mistake prone at this point. And that's a system that is in collapse. Turns out demography does matter. Demography is destiny, we were constantly told. And that's why America is going to be socialist. No, no. Um, maybe not, because the Christians have more babies than you. Oh, they figured that out, and that's why we're flooding the border. China can't flood the border. Ch 
China gets almost no immigration whatsoever and doesn't want it. Because did I mention you can come to America and become an American, but you can't go to China and become Chinese? That's not a culture that assimilates anybody. So that, and by the way, highly racist culture. Yeah. Highly racist. So this is a culture that is imploding demographically because of the murderous one-child policy that they can't pull out of the tailspin from. And weirdly enough, much of East Asia did it to themselves. They didn't have a one-child policy. They didn't have forced abortions. But they've got total fertility rates as bad or lower than China in many, many East Asian countries, including South Korea, including Taiwan, certainly including Japan. They're already in their tailspin. They've lost 20 million people over the last generation. Whole villages are empty. They're shutting down elementary schools all the time. Immigration is good for us to a degree because we actually have a ridiculous birth rate. But the, the cross-tabs in that, if you will, are that Christians are having lots of children. Socialists are having no children. Socialists are mutilating the children they do have so that they can never reproduce. The ones they don't murder in the womb. So that's why they have to do what they're doing now. Remember, Bill Clinton was against illegal immigration. There was a switch. Why was there a switch? Because they figured out what the demographic picture looked like over 20 years that there was going to be a permanent Republican majority, and they absolutely had to find a way to torpedo that. That's what's happening. They used to stuff ballot boxes. Now they stuff the electorate. And it's not just illegal voting, don't misunderstand, and it won't be illegal for long if you let Kamala have power because they're going to legalize all these people. But ignore that, that's neither here nor there. The real issue is even if not one of these people ever voted and Rasmussen just polled a bunch of them and they're all voting and they have been for the last several elections and they intend to continue, not all of them, but enough to flip the election. What else is happening? Oh, if you flood California with illegals, they've got more population, and the Census Bureau now won't just count citizens, so they get more House members and they get more electoral votes. Oh. Or you send 20,000 Haitians to Springfield, Ohio, which is a red area, and flip it blue and create a one-party state, which is always the aim. The Confederacy was a one-party state. The South for a century after the war was a one-party state. This is always what they do without compunction and without compassion and without change. Politics is an unmitigated blessing because in all the systems just described, you have no say and in our system, you have all the say. You're the king collectively. Individually, we have no king but Jesus. Collectively, we are the king. We are in the place of David. We are in the place of Josiah. We are in the place of Hezekiah. And we better not act like Manasseh. Amen. Which a lot of us are. Politics is an unmitigated blessing. That's why I'm a Baptist. Now, a lot of our Baptist preachers don't understand this. Their, their mindset is colored by the fact that they can go in a Wednesday night business meeting and be kicked out of the parsonage. And uh, so they see politics as a bad thing. And I understand the mindset. I, 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 as I told uh, actually lots of people, I was a Southern Baptist long before I was Christian. So, you know, I'm, I'm marinated in it. And uh, I know how they think. But just because he's your pastor doesn't mean he knows everything about everything. You wouldn't ask him to give you your root canal, and you probably shouldn't ask him about this unless he's him. You know, he's amazing. We've got some pastors in this room who are incredible. But the average Southern Baptist preacher probably last had a government class in high school. So that might not be your best source for information on this a lot of the time. 
And it's a shame because they should understand it. They should understand the Israelite Republic. They should understand that the power was ultimately with the people in Israel, even after the monarchy commenced. And the evidence of that is as plain as day, they come together to decide if they're going to make David their king. They come together to decide if they're going to take him back after Absalom. They come together to decide on Rehoboam. The power was with the people. God's annoyance with them in 1 Samuel 8 is in large part because they're giving that up. Because, and let's think about this, guys, they wouldn't have needed to if they hadn't been such wanton sinners. A self-governed people doesn't need much government. This is why righteousness matters, aside from the fact that you don't want to go to hell. And you don't want to, you know, if you're a believer, you don't want to hurt your father. But on a societal level, a people that actually believes in the standards God has given us and acts on them doesn't need a lot of police, doesn't need a lot of courts, doesn't need a lot of lawsuits, doesn't need an FBI, doesn't need some big regulatory apparatus because people just do right. And by the way, that's our history. Most of our history in this country is we had very little government. Very little. It's only in the 20th century when we moved more and more away from being a people of faith, more and more away from pulpits proclaiming righteousness, more and more away from orthodox pulpits into liberal pulpits. And some of you here are familiar with Gresham Machen, so you know he wrote Christianity and Liberalism. And, and in the theological context, he posits that liberalism isn't a form of Christianity. It's a completely different religion. And it is. It absolutely is. And the more we moved from where we'd been, the more government... We justified, implemented, and oppressed ourselves with, not to mention paid for. Politics is an unmitigated blessing that most Christians don't participate in. So somebody was talking about the parable of the talents. They sure should have. I, I, I know Matthew wasn't primarily talking about American government but wasn't he did God not write that book is that book not to all of us for all the ages are its principles not timeless does its wisdom not apply to all things whatsoever God has given you a talent it is the American nation the American nation is the most powerful wealthiest force in human history, humanly speaking. And he handed it to you. And you're not going to vote. You're not going to run for office. You're going to just cede power to the people who hate Christ. See, I don't hate them, but they hate me. I don't hate them, but they hate my father. I don't hate them, but they hate my Savior. I think you should care. I think you should care enough to not let them be a senator. I think you should care enough to not let them be a city councilman. I think you should care enough to not let them run your school board. I hope you're all homeschooling. I did, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't care about what's happening in your public schools. Because honestly, we need to restrain wickedness wherever we can. Oh, Rod, you're being a theocrat. No, I'm not. I don't even need to be. Jesus is king. And I don't want a human king, thank you, no. I would like that extremely decentralized government handed to us by our founders, very much modeled on what we see in ancient Israel, that God ordained, that God said was good. And what's wrong with the system of government in Israel? Law breaking. 
The Israelites were lawbreakers, and so God sent curses on them repeatedly for four centuries in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. Then they took on kings, and the kings were unrighteous. And so God sent curses on them again and again, trying to chastise them like sons, trying to teach them the lesson, trying to encourage them to repent. But they, hearing, would not hear, Seeing did not see. And by the way, don't take this as being a soteriological discussion. We are not actually having a lecture today on the Ordo Salutis. That is not my point. My point is to talk about your responsibility. Because you're responsible regardless of God's sovereignty. The first word preached by John the Baptist was, anybody know? Repent. You know what the first word preached by Jesus was? Repent. Does it actually matter whether those people had the ability to repent regardless of you know, God's action on them in what order? No, because guess what? As I have explained it eight billion times, Everyone has the ability to follow the law, and nobody does it. Everybody has a choice. We, are, uh, we have friends who talk about double predestination. That's just silly. God gives everybody a choice, and everybody chooses wrong. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's why you need a pardon. That's why you need grace. Grace for, you know, for those in the back, that's unmerited favor, you know. You didn't earn it. Even the faith is the gift of God, we are told, that no man should boast. I believe it. But I know I'm responsible. I know that those sins that I committed because I have a sin nature and I'm a bad person are my responsibility. They're my fault they are my burden unless Jesus lifts it off of me. If I am not clothed in his righteousness, I have none. None. Because I was a traitor. I was a traitor to the king. And do you know what we do to traitors to the king? We execute them. We send them to hell for all eternity. That's, that's what that is. That's punishment for treason. Sometimes we try to make sin sound a whole lot nicer than it is. It's not nice at all. You know, sometimes, you know, I know when I was a child, and I reasoned like a child, you know, the rest. I remember thinking, well, why should I go to hell? Because I told a white lie to my third grade teacher. You know, Hitler's over here killing millions of Jews, and I'm, I'm going to go to hell just the same as Hitler. Well, first of all, God doesn't say that hell's going to be the same for everybody. God explicitly tells us heaven's not going to be the same for everybody. Some of you are going to have very different rewards than others, probably different in quantity as well as quality, based on things you have done and treasure you have stored up in heaven. Where do we get this idea of equality? I'm all for equality under the law. I'm all for the rule of law. I am grateful that we have the system we have in America, but there is hierarchy built into the fabric of the universe. Amen. And God gets to bless or curse as he sees fit because he is God and you are not. So here we are. Here we find ourselves. I am responsible. You know, an axe murderer might say, well, I, it's not my fault. God made me this way. Oh, well, maybe he did, but it's still your fault. <laughs> Sending you to prison. Right. The drunk gets behind the wheel and kills a kid on the highway. You know, oh, I was drunk. It's not my fault. No. Well, God made me an alcoholic. Don't care. You killed a kid. Oh, Jeffrey Dahmer, I like eating people. I, I'm, this is just the way I am. No, we're not allowing that. Lots of people have all kinds of 
uh, predispositions to all kinds of sins. Oh, wait, let me rephrase that. Every last one of you has all kinds of predispositions to all kinds of sins. That is the doctrine of original sin. That is the sin nature. And all of you are responsible for what you do anyway. That's not fair. I don't care. I don't make the rules. I don't make the rules. You don't either. Stop trying. Here's what you should try to do. You should try to make rules for our civilization that are ordered on God's rules. You should try to extend righteousness and you should try to, to restrain wickedness. That's what you should do. And the number one way we do that in America because this is the Jesus and Politics Conference. The number one way we do that in America is through our ballot box. You say, well, my ballot box may be corrupted. Well, then become a poll watcher. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, maybe that's not enough. Okay, go recruit a lawyer. Well, maybe that's not enough. Well, go talk to your sheriff. Well, I don't have a problem in my jurisdiction, but they do over in that other county. Then go to that other county. Well, I'm busy. No, you're responsible. No, you're responsible. Well, that, that's just not my calling. No, this is all of our calling. That's the price of freedom. You get to live in a society where we get to rule ourselves the price of that is that it's all our calling. You may be individually called to preach. You may be individually called to be an evangelist. You may individually be called to be a musician. You may individually be called to even be a lawyer. God forbid. I've got one of those degrees, so, you know, I can say that. And Maybe you're, maybe you're called to be a venture capitalist. Maybe you're called to be the janitor. It doesn't matter. All of these callings are important before God, and you should do them as unto the Lord, but you have some core callings that don't go away based on your primary calling, such as the Great Commission. Which, by the way, let, let, let's just remember that. Everybody leaves out the first part of it where Jesus says, All power in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Oh, so you mean Jesus is reigning at the right hand of God the Father right now over the affairs of men? Why, yes, yes, I do. Jesus said so. Then he says, therefore. You always quote the therefore and don't quote the antecedent? That's just silly. Your English teacher is going to be mad at you. <laughs> You won't graduate on time. It's bad. Because Jesus has all power whatsoever, therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. There's that word again. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Well, what does that mean? Well, certainly means making disciples out of each of the nations. That part's true. Sorry about that. Uh, that's certainly true. But I think it means more than that. I think it means to actually disciple all of those nations. Amen. Yeah. Not just individually, but collectively. Because this expands righteousness and restrains evil. Yeah. And the whole world is made better when even unbelievers outwardly conform to the truth. Right. You see it in Japan, which was flattened. We literally nuked to them. And within a generation, they're one of the richest countries in the world. Why? Because they adopted a Western constitution based on the rule of law and not an emperor and not a military dictator. And they adopted a largely capitalist private property system. And all of a sudden, they're rich. They were nuked. They were actually nuked. We use that word like, you know, you know hyperbole. They actually had it. And the truth is the destruction we did in Tokyo through firebombing was much greater than what we did at Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So, so okay, these people who are not believers, about 1% of Japanese people are Christians, aren't believers, aren't in covenant with Christ, have no formal confession that you would approve of, 
but they outwardly follow some of God's law and they prosper. Now look at Venezuela. Look at North Korea. Look at Cuba. Look at Russia. And honestly, if you look beneath the lying government statistics, look at China, which is about to be an epic train wreck that you're just not going to believe. Yes, this next decade's a little dangerous because they know it and they're still strong, but they aren't going to be strong for a lot longer. As the developmental econom economists would say, they're going to get old before they get rich and they're not going to be able to afford it. Why? Because they didn't follow God's law, which starts with be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. That creation mandate is the other side of the Great Commission coin. That Great Commission goes on to say, you know, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, which we only do to believers, right? Sorry, Presbyterians, but that's how it works. And, uh, you know, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Oh, there's that righteousness again. Well, I don't like that part of the law. Well, tough. It's God's. Well, I don't think that part of the law applies. Okay, well, exegete it and let's talk about it. I don't think most of the law applies either. I, I, don't, I can wear garments of multiple, uh, multiple uh, threads, and I, can, I, can, uh, I, I don't have to sacrifice sheep, which is great, because sheep are nasty, and I don't want them around. And, uh, you know, the, the barbecue part is good, but not the sheep part. And, uh, and I get to eat sushi, and I get to eat pulled pork. So I'm loving all that. You know, that takes down about two-thirds of the law of Moses right there. All those seed laws, all those, all those ceremonial laws, Christ liberated you from that. But there's a whole bunch of cross-boundary laws that apply forever. Like, you shall not steal. And here's a news flash to the Democrats. The Tenth Commandment is, you shall not even think about it. Right. Not just you shall not steal, you shall not even think about it. The Democrats are based on a systematic violation of everything the Lord has taught. They hate God. Not every one of them. Not saying that. But I watched their representatives in convention in 2012 boo the mere mention of God. I watched Kamala Harris get up and say that the Christian had come to the wrong rally. I'm not stupid. Don't, don't choose to disbelieve the testimony of your eyes here. They're just right out there, plain as day. They believe in stealing everything you have because they believe it belongs to the state in the first place. And the state doesn't mean you. The state means them. There's a reason they talk about this or that thing being a threat to our democracy. You know, they don't mention this, but in the late 19th century, they referred to the Democratic Party as the democracy. They're talking about themselves. Our democracy, not your democracy. Definitely not your democracy. You have a responsibility to extend righteousness and restrain evil. You have been given a talent. You have been given an opportunity to rule yourselves. You have been given an opportunity to disciple those around you in this nation and in other nations. We will disciple some of these people through the adoption process into this polity, and that will be good, but they need to follow these rules. We shouldn't really have people who believe in the Pope being a member of a Baptist church. It's just kind of basic. If you have people who want to join the garden club who hate plants, that's a bad idea. We don't do that. We have rules. You're joining because you agree. You guys have to fence that table. Say, well, my one vote doesn't count. Well, that's funny because in 2000, we decided the presidency of the United States by a grand total of 537 votes in one state. Mm -hmm. 
I've lost count of the number of elections in this country just in the last 20 years that were decided by 10 votes or less. One of those, you'll recall, involved Al Franken. He ran against a sitting United States Senator and they just kept counting newly discovered ballots until he won. And all of a sudden, they didn't need to find any more ballots. No more secret ballot boxes were, un, were uncovered. Nobody else had a ballot box in their trunk that everybody forgot about. You know, do they think we're rubes? There's a chain of custody for all of these things. We, you don't lose ballot boxes, and yet every year they do. And somehow, all of the votes in those ballot boxes are for them. Year after year after year after year. And why would this surprise us? Chicago is a globe-girdling joke when it comes to election fraud. Tammany Hall is a byword. The big city machines have always operated this way. And what one party ruled every one of those big city machines? The Democrats. And only the Democrats. Is this an advertisement for the Republican Party? Are you kidding? We're terrible. I've been a Republican all my life, and I can tell you no one hates my party as much as me. I mean, it's just the worst. I've been an official of the Republican Party all the way up the chain. It's, the, it's terrible. And I'm still a member, and I'll tell you why. Because it is the only effective vehicle for us to defeat this evil. It's all we got. If you want a third party, you need a different country or a different constitution or something. This system doesn't work for that. We've tried it again and again. One of the things about being a conservative is we believe in empirical data over time. That doesn't work. So what would work? You know what? If all you fine folks brought 10 more just like you, you could win a primary somewhere. Maybe it's just a primary for school board. Maybe it's just a primary for the county sheriff. I don't know. County sheriffs matter. School boards matter. You're responsible. I'm just one. Okay, I am just one, but I am one. So I'm going to do what I'm called to do. I wasn't called to preach. Thank God. That's a good thing. But I was called to some specific things, and I try to do those with all my might, to glorify Christ and to extend his kingdom on this planet and other planets in the future. Somebody mentioned I'm CEO of Martin Capital. I was one of the guys who helped start PayPal. Um, we're very serious about the human future. We're very serious about it being free. I have joked, but I'm not joking, in several speeches that I intend to found the Martian Baptist Convention. And it is a joke, but it isn't because, you know, Elon's going to move a few million people onto Mars before he dies, and they're all going to need a church. They're all going to need a church. We've got to start thinking that way. The church has to be more forward-looking. We also have to look at our neighborhoods. Are we walking those neighborhoods as well as the Democrats are walking precincts? I'm guessing not. I, I went to talk to the pastor of a church in my hometown about maybe joining, and you know, we just asked him, so what's the visitation strategy for this big housing development that wraps all around this church? What do you mean visitation? They'd never knocked on a door. You're responsible. If somebody isn't getting it done, don't wait for them to do it. You do it. And drag friends along. If, if somebody isn't voting right, don't wait for somebody else to vote right. You go vote right and drag friends along. Oh, well, they can't get to the polls. Pick them up. You have a car. If you don't have a car, rent a car for the day. Rent a van. Rent a bus. The Democrats are. 
Is it not worth preserving your First Amendment rights? Which, by the way, they're not just talking about freedom of speech. They're not just talking about freedom of the press. They're not just talking about the freedom of assembly, though if they were to crunch those three things, you would have a lot of trouble. No, they're talking about the freedom of religion, first and foremost. Because the one thing that does not survive in a two plus two equals whatever the party says it equals society is religion, specifically yours. They can tolerate those others. But yours comes with a sovereign God who gets to decide what is right and wrong without a majority vote and without the sign-off of the White House. And that is the one thing that must never be tolerated. Caesar wouldn't tolerate it. Pharaoh wouldn't tolerate it. Hitler wouldn't tolerate it. And these people won't either. And the hour is late. Jesus and politics, that's easy. I'm responsible to Jesus. He is the king. He has given me a limited piece of our collective authority that he has delegated to us, and we must go exercise it responsibly. And so I got on an airplane, and I flew across the country, including a five-hour layover in Charlotte, North Carolina, which has to be the worst airport in the world, and I did that to come exhort you, because that's something I can do. I can stand up here in front of a microphone, I can talk my head off, and I'm about to have to hush, because you're gonna throw me out. But, but I can do this. You can do something. I don't know what you can do. You can register somebody to vote, take them to the polls, you can persuade them that 1 Samuel 8 isn't kidding when it says that taxes as much as the tithe are tyranny. Amen. The draft is tyranny. <clears throat> the government appropriating your property is tyranny. God told them. It's all right there. We just don't preach that stuff. Well, he does. We don't preach these things. We're not preaching the full counsel of God. That's why America is where it is. That's how the Democratic Party went off the rails. Not enough people preaching the full counsel of God. So at the very least, you can have a Bible study. You can talk to a friend. You can have coffee with somebody who doesn't think any of this matters. You can tell them what you heard at this conference that stuck with you. Probably not much of what I say, but, you know, uh, William was awesome, don't you think? He was great, you know? All these guys were, and, uh, and it was worth coming just to hear you, William, my goodness. <laughs> and you, Tim, for sure. Do what you can do. You are responsible. You have your talent. Invest it. Don't hide it. And, folks... I don't care that you're just one. You are one. Do your part. You're responsible. God will judge you. You will stand before the throne and give account to what you did in this dark hour. You will. It does matter. It is part of your faith. And I'll tell you why, and then I'll hush. Because literally everything is part of your faith. There is no part of creation that is not part of of Christendom, that is not part of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, that is not under that grant of all power in heaven and on earth. There is nothing that isn't going to bow the knee to Christ. There is nothing because he is God. He is the creator and time is but for a moment and eternity is really long. And as it happens, he tells us at the end of Revelation that the garden will be made like a city, that the new Jerusalem descending out of the sky, we see all the rivers from Eden, we see the gemstones, see all the symbolism. And, and what's really the difference between a garden with two people and a city? Population. He's going to fill the earth and subdue it with you, with you, with your kids, your grandkids. He's going to do that. And that family, that family, that body of Christ must conform to Christ, not by the sword, but by persuasion, by persuasion, by persuasion. Get in that pulpit and preach. Get at that coffee shop and talk to your friends. Do what you have to do. You are called to persuade. That's what making disciples is. You're going to persuade them.
And that is the basis of the American system, that we rule by persuasion and not by force. That we rule by persuasion and not by force. And that, my friends, is why politics is an unmitigated blessing. Keep it, hold on to it, be grateful for it, exercise it. Thank you.